Hi, everybody. I'm here with Dak Rouleau of overwritten.org. And uh, we're going to talk about the presidential candidates in a way that I don't think most people really think about the presidential candidates. Certainly not how any of the uh, mainstream media talk about the presidential candidates, but something that I think is really important to who they are as people and how they would be as uh, running a country, a uh, nuclear armed country that has a tendency to go to war at the drop of a hat. Um, so I don't know, I, I'll briefly explain what I mean by interstitial spaces because I would like to like get into the interstitial spaces of these politicians here. Basically, there, most of the things we do throughout a different day are, they don't have a name. Like you, maybe you look a certain way or you give a glance to a person in, in a, a way that there's no word for because they're just ordinary actions that we don't think deserve a word. But these actions actually take up most of our time. I mean, any named actions would maybe constitute, I've never tried to calculate this, but I would say like less than a quarter of our time are de devoted to named actions. So the, the, the philosophy of a society is basically wrapped up in these interstitial spaces in how people interact with one another in the subverbal level in the like sub, uh, they're not, overtly stated, but there's a difference between, say, how people interact in a communist society versus how people interact in a capitalist society, socialist society, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, you've been on the campaign trail with these lovely people, and you can tell us a little bit about the interstitial spaces. So um, yeah, uh, I guess I would say that th that's something that's very important that doesn't come across in television, doesn't come across in interviews, uh, because nobody really cares. They want to hear the policy platform. They want to hear debates with like the, the five seconds that you get to answer a, a very canned and false sounding question. Um, but we want to hear about who these people actually are as people. So um, who would you say, I guess, is, uh, well, I guess m my viewers probably don't know much about you. So how did you get into the whole idea of uh, following these candidates around and asking them questions? And um, well, I'll let you describe what the question that you ask them. Well, um, I suppose it started seven years ago during the uh, 2012 uh, campaign when uh, a lot of Republican uh, presidential candidates started coming to my then tenure. Um, they came to sh uh, you know, sell their slogans and try to promise people that better days are ahead and that Laconia would be brought out of its endless economic turmoil. Um, but of course, that never happened. Um, so... Fast forward to 2020, I wanted to find out why these presidential candidates would not answer any questions about Julian Assange. And I found out that it's because the mainstream media would not ask them about Julian Assange. Um, so I decided I would ask them, beginning with Andrew Yang. Um, and the, uh, I noticed how uncomfortable he would get when he was faced with a question for which he did not have a pre-prepared answer. It wasn't just Julian Assange, it was a woman who asked him if his UBI program would uh, disqualify people from other forms of federal assistance, like food stamps or what have you. He chuckled nervously, didn't want to answer that question. When I asked Elizabeth Warren about Julian Assange, she gave me the most quizzical look I had seen in a while. And, and I, I realized that having someone who was really independent out there, who really did not have any ties to any kind of corporation or in, uh, organization uh, really put these candidates on a spot in a, a way that exposed who they really are. Would you say that they had like a series of answers depending on what box they could put you in and then they would have given you that kind of answer depending on that or just the Julian Assange question didn't fit in, into any of those boxes or was it something uh, a different kind of bemusement or befuddlement? Uh, well, the Assange question definitely puts them on the spot in a way that they're not comfortable with because they don't want to, um, they don't want to answer that question and they're not prepared to answer that question because, of course, the, the corporate media will never uh, present that question to them. That's why somebody like me can exist is because the corporate media hasn't done its job. The corporate media will ask them only very uh, standard, repetitive questions about where they stand on something like universal health care or gun control, something that they're prepared to answer over and over again. And and that they love answering over and over again because it lets them give out their taglines and their slogans and their catchphrases that basically reduce them to a, a a marketing gimmick rather than a person. Now you've you were you get to see them before they really uh, become ready for prime time. So you saw them in their early yeah. half formed stages. Uh, would you say that any of them have really developed? Have they developed a, a full formed personality or a stage personality that they didn't have at the beginning or? 
Yeah, and it's very depressing to see. Um, with Andrew Yang, for example, when I went to, when I met him in Concord, that's the uh, my home, my now hometown, um, I uh, was able to get right up close to him and stick the camera in his face because he had no security to speak of. He had a few people who were following him with cameras and things like that, basic media people, but he didn't have any uh, security. When I saw him again three months later at the New Hampshire Democratic Party convention, um, he was flanked by security, um, very well-dressed men who were making sure to shuttle him from appointment to appointment, making sure he stood in front of the crowd only for a few minutes and then made sure to hurry him off to the booth where he could talk to uh, MSNBC and WMUR. Um, it, it's, you see him lose that kind of warm, friendly, approachable demeanor that he had three months ago. And now he's just been reduced to the cold, distant, aloof politician who looks down on people rather than looks at them. Do you think that- uh, But for most of the others, they, what, what's that? Sorry, I was going to ask, do you think that that happens like through a process of trial and error? Like this is what works, uh, this is what I'm going to do again. So I have to put less thought into it or is it just uh, bumping up against people so many times the authenticity gets sanded off the edges and you see like the sort of robotic uh, political functionary underneath or? Oh, it's both, 100% <laughs> it's both. Um, the problem with, with him is that he's been answering literally the same question over and over again. All that man ever talks about is U UBI. You, you can talk to him about literally any issue and he will turn it back to UBI. So he, he's been talking about that so many times that it, 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 he is robotic, as you said. Um, but also it, it, when he's, um, when you have, when you rise in the polls to a level where you are now a top tier candidate and you are being granted social uh, secret service and th those kinds of um, privileges, that kind of access to the media, it, it, it's going to weaken whatever kind of moral integrity you may have had. It's going to ablate whatever honest uh, intentions you may have possessed at one time. Your integrity gets dulled and you, you begin to uh, play the part rather than try to be a, a, a human being, even if it was your intention at the beginning to try to be authentic and to try to have a little bit of humanity. You lose your soul basically out there on the campaign trail and uh it's just the, it's the, that way with journalists it's that way with politicians it's um it's a very demoralizing dehumanizing process and that's why it's such a dark uh th there's this dark attraction to it for so many people because with that power comes the end of your spirit now i interrupted you before you were going to describe how the other candidates had evolved or devolved or revolved uh oh. as along the campaign trail who else all I was going to say for them is that there's been no change um, because somebody like Cory Booker or Elizabeth Warren already had no humanity. Those people were already fake right from the word go. So all they do is they they were already beginning at a point of deep cynicism. They just become increasingly cynical the further they go along. Um, so they don't they certainly don't evolve as human beings, but I'm not convinced that they devolve either. It's it's more like they just um, they just uh, wade within the muck as as it were, and these like uh, the, the sediments and the leeches of the bog start to attach to them. And they're just, it's not so much that they've changed who they are constitutionally, it's just that they're picking up so much more baggage and carrying so much more dead emotional weight. The, 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 the pain of having to fake this over and over again really begins to wear them down. And you can see that in their lack of enthusiasm. You can see that in their weathered visage. It's just, it's a, like I said, it's such a dehumanizing process, but it's so, it's so fascinating to see the decomposition. Do you think that, that the, the stress of, or the, the exhaustion of moving all that weight around is why they'll maybe tell the same story over and over and over as uh, Cory Booker did, you said? I'll let you describe that encounter. But like, is, are, do, do all of them have like stories that they tell at every thing? I know Tulsi talks about uh, making a toffee or something for everybody in Congress to, to bring them closer together. I mean, do they, do they all have like a catch, uh, a, a, a way to identify them, say, if people don't know their policies or haven't heard of them before, like this story that they'll tell at every stop? Oh, yeah, they all do that um, because, and it, to be fair to them, it would be un unrealistic to expect them to... Uh, 
come up with a completely 100% new speech at every single rally. Because if you're doing three or four rallies in one day, you, you can't be expected to have completely new material every single time. But, but there is a serious problem of um, the repetition taking over and consuming the speech. Each. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard does have certain catchphrases. Like, for example, um, at the, the last debate she was in, her closing statement, um, she talked about uh, the experience of when she was in Hawaii and the emergency signal went out and uh, she would realize that there was nowhere to go in the event of a nuclear disaster. It's that phrase, nowhere to go, that I had heard probably 15 times before she voiced it at the, uh, the debate for, uh, to, to a national audience. Um, Kamala Harris, uh, too, she, had, she in that same debate closed by saying, we need someone who can prosecute the case against four more years of Donald Trump. Again, I had heard her say that in person. Um, but uh, the, the difference between someone like Tulsi Gabbard and somebody like, say, Cory Booker is that Tulsi Gabbard does try to diversify her speech to, to whatever extent is possible, where she isn't just rehashing it over and over. Cory Booker has a script from which he does not deviate, except in a very superficial sense. And it's when you see a politician recite a script, like the same exact words from start to finish, that you begin to see that these really are just actors who are just uh, saying something that's been prepared for them, probably by a focus group, and that they're not really speaking from the heart. Do any of them ever go off script or improvise, or do they talk with people in the audience at all at any great length, or is it just sound bites? They will occasionally field questions from the audience, depending on the kind of event uh, that they're hosting. Um, I'm not sure how many of those people in the audience are authentic um, individuals or how many of them are maybe planted by the campaign. Um, I, I, that's something I've all often wondered about. Like I've seen situations where a six-year-old child will ask a, a very articulate, very formal, uh, rigidly worded question, and I just wonder uh, how did how did the politician know to call upon that one little girl or that one little boy? Um, but uh, for the most part, it, it, again, it, it depends on the candidate. Like. Uh, Tulsi Gabbard will try to go off script when possible. Cory Booker never will because he really has nothing to say. And I think that kind of lack of authenticity is one of the reasons he's struggling so badly in the polls um, is, is because people can see right through his mendacity. Um, interactions with the audience, they will always regiment it. And if they can't control the duration, if, if they get a question they don't like, they know how to uh, reinterpret it so that they can make it about them. Like when I went to see Elizabeth Warren, a man in the audience asked her about the delegate system in the DNC. She used that to go uh, make a point about uh, a housing project, how to bring affordable housing into America. It's very awkward to see. It's very off-putting. Yeah, I would think that a lot of people who, who go to these events to meet the candidates are specifically doing so because they want to see like, what is this person like as a human being? And then if they don't get a chance to do that, it's got to be kind of just disappointing. I know a couple of years ago, Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Facebook, who is one of the most loathsome human beings on the planet, was doing what I thought was kind of like a pre-presidential like meet and greet, like flying around middle America and being photographed looking extremely awkward with like normal American families and whatnot. And um, I figured that like people who go to these events are doing so to hopefully avoid a Zuckerberg situation where at least you don't have like an Android sitting in the White House. But it sounds to me like just the, the, the stress of uh, going to event after event after event kind of turns everybody into an Android by default, even if they don't necessarily want to be one. I mean, do you talk to the other people who go to these events at all? Or do you just uh, wait to speak to the candidates or the people around them? Um, I talk to the people in the audience as much as I can tolerate, um, but it's usually a, a pretty uh, sickening experience as well. Um, I pr Probably I, I will ask them like what they think about the candidates, but their answers are so homogenous and their answers are so boilerplate that there's really no point in even talking to them. Like I remember at, a, uh, at Joe Biden's house party, as they call it, um, a lot of these candidates do the house parties. I've been to very few actual house parties. Typically, it's Joe Biden standing on a balcony and speaking to the people gathered on the lawn. It's very Marie Antoinette, very, uh, very gilded age. But um, no, he, uh, 
there was a woman in the audience and I went up to her and I said, so, uh, you know, are you uh, excited about voting for Joe Biden? And she goes, well, I, 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 you know, I haven't decided yet. I'm, I'm thinking between four different people. I said, oh, who, who are your four? And she goes, oh, Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Kamala Harris, and I can't remember who the fourth one was, probably Cory Booker or something, but I just would ask them, you know, why, why do you like these candidates? And they would say, well, you know, I think Joe Biden has the best chance of defeating Donald Trump. And literally every Joe Biden voter I've spoken, not that I've met very many Joe Biden voters, they, um, they seem to have what I call the Cinnabon effect. Um, Louis C.K. had a skit where he said that nobody actually likes going to Cinnabon. It's just a bunch of really obese people groaning as they say, I'm going to Cinnabon. That's the Joe Biden voter. Nobody's enthusiastic about voting for that guy. It's just, I gotta beat Trump, so voting for Biden. You know, it, it's just a very, again, demoralizing experience. Um, but that was the Joe Biden event. Um, I, uh, I met a, a, a girl in uh, high school at an Andrew Yang rally who said she'll be old enough to vote in the general election. And I said, who do you think you wanna vote for? And she goes, probably Kamala Harris. And I asked her why. And she said, you know, because I think women's rights are really important. And I think abortion rights are really important too. It's this very superficial approach to social issues, which is, or social policy, which is already pretty shallow and superficial to begin with. I mean, it's like the skim of the skim at the topmost layer. It's like, you can see that these people really have no understanding of political philosophy at all. Well, I've been saying for a while that like liberals, at least in this day and age, people who call themselves liberals, basically purchase their uh, political philosophy, quote unquote, prepackaged from whatever ideological vendor happens to be around. And so if you think this way about gun control, you must think this way about abortion, you must think this way about open borders, you must think this way about healthcare, et cetera, et cetera. So usually if you fall out of line in one of those things, they just, it's like does not compute, like people don't really know how to deal with it. Because, I mean, I was just writing about this earlier, that this uh, article about anti-social social media, how it's turned us into blithering idiots, uh, basically because it fosters this echo chamber mentality where people, one, one, don't speak to anybody who disagrees with them, and two, don't know how to debate because they never speak to anybody who disagrees with them. So if somebody questions their view on a certain thing, they just kind of like can't deal with it, or they uh, use these thought-stopping techniques that you find in cults. I mean, I've been saying that Russia Gate was a cult for a very long time, and as it turns out, I was right. Quite so. But, um, okay, so you were kind so. of talked about um, the plants in the audience, but, so, oh, sorry, continue. Oh, no, I was going to say, you're, you're, you have absolutely right when you talk about the cult. It's very much a, um, you, you said earlier that you thought that people go to these events to try to learn more about the candidates. Um, not at all. For the most part, it's basically this glorified fan club where people go to slobber and wear the merchandise and, uh, you know, support the, uh, you know, wear the apparel with the slogans and the names and hold banners and all this other foolishness. Um, they herd people into the audience and they will tell them to stand at a certain distance from the podium and come clustered together so that when the cameras look upon the crowd, it looks as if there are more people there than they actually are. Um, it, it's very much about this kind of worshiping the candidate, which is why you know we, there, there's a, this strong sense of adulation and idolatry that goes along with it. Um, and a lot of screaming and shrieking and immature behavior, rather, rather like a sporting event, I find. I, 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 you wrote an article recently where you talked about how um, politics has become like uh, Hollywood. I, I would argue it, it is like that quite a bit, but it also has quite a bit in common with uh, spectator sports, where there's just this complete lack of shame, this real bacchanalian, almost like a carnival atmosphere. And it's very, uh, very off-putting, especially for something that's supposedly as serious as a uh, 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 parliamentary politics. Yeah, it sounds like there's very little that's authentic about it from hearing you describe it, just the way that people are set up, the way that people uh, look at uh, the candidate as this sort of idolized figure. Um, mm. what, what, my phone is ringing and it's distracting me. Um, <laughs> did want to ask about, uh, they seem that they, they do a lot of things for like photo opportunities. Like they, they try to look very yes. like middle America-y, very like down home-y. Like they, they have these steak fries and things like that. Do they actually eat anything at those or is it just all for the cameras? 
Uh, you know, I've been to a lot of uh, the picnics, the uh, the Hampton Democrats picnic or the Belknap County Blue Bash, as it was called, which was unfortunately not nearly as kinky as it sounds. Um, but no, I've never seen them eat a single thing. Um, Cory Booker, in his defense, could not really eat at the Hampton uh, Democrats picnic because he's a vegan. And so he probably... Actually, no, 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 they did have veggie burgers there. So no, he's just standing there while the people in the audience stuff their faces um, after paying $30 a pop to get into that event, by the way. I didn't pay because I promised I would donate and um, I'm working on that. <laughs> um, but the, uh, he, he, um, no, I've never seen them eat. I've never seen them drink anything. It's, it's, it's very, very fake, as you said. But um, to go back to what you said about the pictures, um, Cory Booker has a special approach to that where he likes to take selfies. He doesn't want you, someone saying you're holding uh, the camera for you. He wants to take a selfie and he insists on taking the selfie for you. He rips the phone out of every person's hand and takes the selfie. He, he insists upon it. There's nothing he, he's more afraid of than a cell phone that is not in his palm. And he, he does it over and over again. That's his trademark, as it were. And it, it is trying to make him look like, you know, one of the people trying to make him look like, you know, just he's a regular guy, you know, standing there taking selfies, uh, this, that and the other thing. And, and it's, it's, you see this trend where people will get the, uh, the picture taken with the candidate, whoever it is, they go get it printed on Polaroid film, and then they will frame it and put it in their living room or something. You don't know how many of these house parties I've gone to where I've seen people posing for pictures with Hillary Clinton. That's like everybody's claim to fame is, oh yeah, oh yeah, it's everywhere. Um, it, that seems, she's the most common one I've seen framed on people's walls is uh, Hillary Clinton. See, I always thought that people had to be paid to go to Hillary Clinton rallies. I didn't think that anybody was actually going to the amount of enthusiasm. I mean, you know, now she's like threatening to run again. And it's just like kind the, of insane. The, the Cinnabon but, effect. Yeah. The Cinnabon effect with Hillary Clinton. They don't want to vote for her. But they just yeah. have to. Yeah, that's the exact definition of the Cinnabon effect. I mean, Biden's campaign, even the New York Times has written about how much Biden's campaign like very closely resembles Hillary with the enthusiasm gap, as they call it, which is a really nice way of saying nobody likes this person. But um, yeah. did you think of, uh, there are a couple of Republicans that have been saying that they're going to run against Trump. Have you thought of going to any of their rallies or have you? Oh <laughs> yeah, no, I'm definitely going, I'm, I'm definitely going to at some point, just, just hasn't come on my radar yet, just because I'm trying to, I was trying to get the Democrats on the record regarding Julian Assange and uh, we're, we're all, I'm almost done. Just a couple more to do. And um, then I was kind of, hoping to get that out of the way before I went to the Republican rallies. But but yeah, I, I definitely intend on going there. I just, ha I haven't been to any yet, so I can't comment on that. Um, but uh, the, it, it, I haven't been to a Hillary Clinton rally, so I can't say, but I would assume it's much, I would assume it's, it's very much in common with a Joe Biden's, a lot of corporate atmosphere, a lot of, like you said, lack of enthusiasm, a lot of people who are there more for the star power, the idea that this is a former secretary of state or a former vice president, not just some random uh, congresswoman. Now, getting back to the interstitial spaces thing, is there anything about like any particular candidate's mannerisms that would immediately make you say like, whatever, what, whatever happens, like this person can't be president or on the flip side, anything that makes you want to trust them or makes you at least feel better um, disposed towards them than you would normally be? I don't know if it's possible for a politician to do something that would make me feel comfortable with them. I mean, there, there's always this kind of, um, there's always a kind of wall that emerges between you and the candidate because the candidate is uh, such a prestigious person. You know, they are not like you and me that it, it's just, it's, it's an unavoidable fact of that kind of uh, political aristocracy, that kind of privileged class. Um, but as far as mannerisms go, um, yeah, Cory Booker's terrifying grins that he gives in every single picture really make my skin crawl. Um, Kamala Harris's wicked fake laugh that she, uh, like, it sort of, it almost stutters out of her when she's speaking. Um, Elizabeth Warren scowls when she thinks she's making some kind of uh, grand, uh, eloquent statement and some kind of forceful statement. Like, uh, I remember she announced her bold plan to eliminate corruption in Washington. From now on, every single presidential candidate will have to release his or her tax returns. The crowd screams up in delight and she goes, all of them. 
you know, like as if she's leading the troops into battle or something like that, completely forgetting that this issue with the tax returns is a very specific problem pertaining only to somebody like Trump and is unlikely to be an issue in the future. Again, it's a kind of superficial thing about it. So yeah, when I, when I see them really going after the lowest common denominator like that, uh, that's when I get, I, I'm like, I just go completely frigid and I, there's no way that I can warm up to these people. Is there any sort of sense of like a collective emotion at these things? Like it, you said that, that they sort of idolize the candidate in, at least in some candidates case, like is it like a, a sort of two minutes hate thing against Trump? That's something I wondered because a lot of these people seem to be campaigning specifically against Trump and not for anything at all. Yeah, so at a, uh, um, Kamala Harris is definitely the one who hammers home the anti-Trump rhetoric the most. She will throw out these lines and try to rile up the audience when she refers to him as a predator or something like that. She goes, I know about trying to prosecute predators, and I know the way that predators think, and we have a predator in the White House. And it's, it's that kind of where it, it seems like she's being bold, but really she's trying to make people uncomfortable for sure. She's alluding to like sexual misconduct or things like that. She wants people to get bileless. She wants people to get pissed off. She wants the agit prop to really take off in a way that she, um, you know, is seen as the Avenger, the one who's going to slay Donald Trump. It's not just about taking him out of office. Um, Joe Biden does that quite a bit where he tries to evince what I would call a kind of dignified contempt where it's this, um, this is idea that it, it's, it's okay to be hateful basically because Joe and frames the words in a way to seem a sophisticated uh, critic of the president rather than just someone who's throwing uh, tomatoes at him and stuff. And uh, it, it's that kind of pseudo-intellectual hatred, that kind of hatred in disguise, a hatred that's afraid of itself, that defines uh, the demo most of the uh, Democratic candidates' uh, platforms and uh, atmospheres at their rallies. Would you say there's any kind of sense of fear of saying the wrong thing? Um, like, especially with uh, recent years, there's been all this cancel, people get canceled for uttering the uh, insensitive phrase or whatnot. Um, does, does that uh, influence what they say? Yeah, hundred percent. That's why they wouldn't want uh, a Bernie Sanders, for example, didn't want to talk about Julian Assange is because he he knew that he was um, it, it's it's a topic that's not acceptable to him because if he were to uh, uh, say the wrong thing, then he's going to be not canceled by the people on Twitter because they obviously don't have any real power. He's going to be canceled by the military industrial complex. He's going to be canceled by the CIA. He's going to be canceled by the NSA. And so he has to really watch what he says because uh, otherwise he will bear the brush of the brunt. Um, so uh, yeah, it's obviously very stilted. That's why most of them stick to scripts. And uh, if they, like I said, if they find a question with which they're uncomfortable, they'll just find a way to uh, dodge the question and come up with some uh, kind of cheap selling point. Um, so yeah, they're very much, they control the atmosphere. This idea that it's sort of a populist event where the audience gets to call the shots, that that, um, that hasn't been the case. It, it really, uh, and all the time I've been following these candidates around, I haven't seen that in uh, any of the years that I've done it. Well, another thing that, that you probably doesn't come across in interviews or certainly not in articles written about these people, I notice when I look at Cory Booker, I see somebody who's done way too much cocaine, like way too much. Probably why he wasn't eating the veggie burgers. I mean, that stuff takes away your appetite. Um, would you say any of the other candidates look like they're high or drunk or anything like that, or, or taking little like mother's little helper to get through the stress of the uh, event? Well, well, Cory Booker never tires of letting everybody know that he was a, a college football player. So I have no doubt that he did a line or two in his time. Um, but uh, as for um, uh, I, Joe Biden slurs his words so terribly that it wouldn't shock me at all if he was drunk. I actually mentioned that to an, uh, a woman on my way out of his event in Atkinson. And she was so offended by my comment. She gave me this very stern lecture about how I've obviously never met anybody who was drunk and I've never known anybody who's taken a drink and I've never been drunk myself and I would never make such an offensive statement if I had uh, actually had any firsthand experience with intoxication. I mean, she ranted. Um, but uh, Joe Biden, I, 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 you know, I don't know that he was drunk. It could just be that he's that lazy and inattentive and apathetic that he doesn't care how he sounds. Um, any of them being drunk, I, uh, I don't 
think so. I mean, I, I definitely think some of them are out of their element in a way where they're getting high on their own power. Or in the case of Joe Biden, he could be delirious or disoriented. But um, unfortunately, no, I haven't seen any firsthand evidence of that sort of thing. Um, it would be fabulous if I did, because I would make sure to get the evidence out there. But I just, I now I haven't seen it. Like I said, they make sure to be very prim and professional. Maybe that's why they're so, in such a bad mood all the time, is because <laughs> they can't get sloshed and try to enjoy the day. They see everybody else getting wasted and stuffing their faces, and they can't partake. Maybe it's envy. No, I think that that ship that uh, pulled into, I think it was a Maryland port or something, but it had like billions of dollars worth of cocaine on it, and then it got confiscated. And that was Cory Booker's personal stash. I mean, obviously. That's weird because he did, he did take a ferry out of New Hampshire the day that I confronted him. He insisted that's why he had no time to answer a question from me because he had to make sure he got on that brief. I don't know what kind of buccaneer he is, but maybe he's got some kind of like drama out there on the high seas. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. That'd be interesting to find out. Uh, I need to follow the, uh, the, the nautical tales of the swashbuckling Cory Booker. Uh, he's so repulsive. He looks like a, ba a baby seal who stuck its tail in an electric socket or something. It's it's really it, interesting. It's funny you mentioned the coke because I always said he looked like he had been trapped in his house on a coke binge for three days and he couldn't find any women to you know help him get rid of all this nasty excess energy he just looks like his eyes are bugging out of his head like he's really like on the brink of losing it. It looks almost like that monster in Pan's Labyrinth who has the uh, oh the eyes yeah. That's yeah. kind of, it bugs out in a way where he's just, it makes me deeply uncomfortable. Obviously, he's not going to be the president of the United States. Nobody wants to look at his mug on CNN every morning. Would you say that some, like, some of the complete in inauthenticity of this whole process is the reason, or one of the reasons why there are so few young people looking to actually go into politics? I mean, we have some really old-ass politicians. Bernie Sanders is 78. Mm -hmm. Biden is, like, I think 76. Donald Trump is 74. Uh, Nancy Pelosi is like 95 and pickled in alcohol. Um, it's like th there are not a lot of young people going into politics. It seems to me that that would be one of the main reasons. And, and, and don't forget Elizabeth Warren is 70. A lot of people don't. Oh, uh, A lot of people forget that she is a septuagenarian. A lot, oh, she's sure. a septuagenarian. My coworker would never forgive me if I didn't mention that today because he's made <laughs> sure to say it to me every day for the last two weeks. But sorry about that, Brian. Um, but anyway, the, uh, the, the problem is that, uh, you know, you mentioned that how it seems like there's a lack of young people in politics, but at the same time, um, they make sure that their staff is filled with young people, especially young women. They want the staff to seem very young and, you know, lively and fertile, because that's supposed to charm the audience, I guess, to see all these young people with all their enthusiasm. Because, yeah, like you say, they don't want it to seem like a, a retirement home. They don't want it to seem like it's, you know, a cemetery waiting to be built, where all these, you know, crypt keepers are staggering around, barely able to stand upright and unable to stop from slurring their words. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's that young people see the corruption and the grotesquerie of it. And so they're, they're, they're turned off uh, by it. They're repelled as they should be. But they make sure to uh, prey on college kids, um, young 20-somethings who don't really have much in the way of a work history, um, shoddy employment records. They make sure to uh, get people who really don't have much uh, better to do with their time than to follow these candidates around and basically wave the giant uh, leaves beside them on the... Uh, the the, the, the RV that Cory Booker rides around when he's in New Hampshire. I swear to God, it's the co-RV, and that's how he goes from event to event, because that's, that's environmentally friendly, I guess. Oh, that's such a big cringe. Um, but speaking of, like, college students, 20-somethings, what, what is the average age of the audience? Like, are we looking at uh, a bunch of college kids who are really excited, or are we looking at people with one foot in the grave who have nothing better to do with their time? Well, it depends on the event. Um, like when I went to see Bernie Sanders and tried to get him on the record regarding Assange, that was at a college uh, campus. That was at Plymouth State University. So, I mean, yeah, it was mostly young people uh, using the gender neutral bathrooms and um, uh, staying away from the uh, dust covered library. But if you go to the uh, the house parties, that's when you see a lot of older people. The uh, the house parties are usually hosted by the small time uh, state politicians that nobody outside of New Hampshire's ever heard of. 
Um, but uh, they, that's where you get most of these old people because there's a sense of like elitism to it. Or maybe it's just because they don't have anything better to do with their time than to go to these house parties. Whereas the college students are already on campus. And so when they finish uh, doing their wake and bake and you know they uh, brush off their sweatshirts and their, uh, their pajama pants, they or put on their pants if they're really feeling ambitious, they'll uh, you know stagger over to the, uh, the little uh, square where Bernie Sanders is gonna make his speech. Um, other candidates, it depends. Cory Booker does not attract any young people because he can attract only old people who are so jaded and dreary um, through years of following politics that they would actually stomach a guy like that. Elizabeth Warren tends to attract younger people mostly because she appeals to girls for um, very superficial and ultimately sexist reasons. Um, but uh, I would say for the most part, it's older people. Yeah, it's, there's, it, there's this kind of, um, there's a sense of prestige that older people see in going to these events that younger people just, that younger people just don't really get starstruck by them in that way. They're, they're too apathetic. Do you think the candidates have any faith in the democratic process or believe there is such a thing as a democratic process or are they just putting on a show and that's why it comes across as so like prepackaged and fake? Uh, no, they don't have any faith in the process whatsoever. Um, they, they're perfectly aware of what they can and cannot do, which is why they can't answer serious questions. I've been saying for quite some time that I don't believe Andrew Yang is seriously running a presidential campaign here. I think that boost his national image so that he can become a commentator on cable news when it's all said and done. Um, it's possible that Marianne Williamson is doing the same thing. Um, some of them... Uh, I think Tulsi Gabbard, for example, I think what she's doing is she's trying to stick her middle finger in the face of the DNC, um, which I'm perfectly fine with that. Um, that's what Ron Paul was doing to the Republican Party back in 2012. So, hey, I'm good with that. But um, somebody like uh, somebody like Cory Booker, Cory Booker is not seriously auditioning for the role of president of the United States. He's auditioning for a part in the presidential cabinet of the eventual winner. Um, a, a guy like maybe Bill de Blasio might have been doing the same thing. Um, no, they, they know that the media decides who the, uh, the nominee will be. They, they know the role that the media has in this. Because what people don't realize is that the Democratic Party is actually much better at keeping out outsiders than the Republican Party is. Um, they keep it under lock and key, as we saw with Bernie Sanders getting screwed over back in 2016 by Hillary Clinton and her goons. Um, I'm not convinced that Donald Trump could have done what he did within the Democratic Party. I, I'm not convinced that... It, outsider really could usurp the king in that way the way that he did so yeah it's very um it's a very uh fait accompli they, they they know what's coming it's a tragic inevitability well especially in 2016 i mean hillary was basically in line for her coronation there's no way that trump could have made it into the democratic party even with a giant army right. and it wasn't working he had like all kinds of exploratory committees and stuff to find out what the uh issues that the republicans cared about were and that's why he was so hard on immigration at first because apparently that was the issue he had all kinds of consultants and stuff so he's not quite as like uh the seat of his pants as he looks although he was pretty by the seat of his pants um i don't know i don't know i i, I found found him interesting from from the point of view of being a, like a bull in a china shop kind of thing and it yes. was it made me very happy to see hillary clinton suffer and which is why i'm not happy about this whole her going back in i mean who do you think is going to be the nominee based on what you've seen oh jesus i i i don't even know i mean like I, honestly before the heart attack i probably would have said bernie sanders but um, with it declining the way it is, it looks like it probably will end up being Elizabeth Warren. Um, you mentioned uh, Hillary Clinton. Yeah, it's funny how having all of the arms industries, all of the corporate money behind her, uh, killing people in order to advance her uh, campaign, none of that seemed to uh, be enough for her. It just, it was not enough. And she could not get over the hill and defeat Donald Trump. Um, Hillary Clinton entering the, the can the, the, the race at this point, I, I think we're getting right near that point where she would either have to jump in or it is too late. The, um, now we, we see that she is talking about how, uh, there needs to be a rematch. That was her quote that just came out within the last, uh, 48 hours or so. Um, but at the same time, I don't know if she's prepared to go in there and usurp, uh, Elizabeth Warren, um, who has, uh, 
been res- taking so much money from people who are close to Clinton. I just, I, I don't know. So I'm not exactly 100% on board with the theory that Hillary Clinton is going to run. Um, so now at this point, if Hillary Clinton is not going to run, I would probably say Elizabeth Warren. Um, were Clinton to run, I think that Democratic voters might be that stupid that they actually think that she should do it again. Because if at first you uh, don't take the hint, by all means, keep humiliating yourself on the global stage. Third time's times the charm. What's that? I said third time's the charm. Yeah, Yeah, no, Clinton has been actually consulting like that behind the scenes with Warren this entire time, which when it came out, there was a bit of a fuss over that because there are like three people who believe that Warren is a progressive or something, and I don't really understand what those people are coming from. But then again, there are people who trust Bernie Sanders, again, after he screwed everybody over in 2016 by saying, after months and months of, like, slamming Hillary Clinton for being a corrupt, warmongering scumbag, saying, hey, you should vote for this corrupt, warmongering scumbag, because, you know, what do you want, Donald Trump? And it's like, you know, there are third party candidates. You can at least like save some face by suggesting people vote for Jill Stein or something like it's uh, no (laughs) telling telling the people who just spent a whole lot of time uh, volunteering on your behalf, knocking on doors, calling phones to go and vote for the person that you've set up as your enemy is just a really slimy, scumbaggy ish thing to do. So I don't know. I mean, is there any sense of like uh, injured trust in the Bernie Sanders audience or am I the only person who feels that way? Well, um, his supporters tend to be some of the most enthusiastic because they very much believe in Bernie. There's a kind of, I don't want to say cult because because that puts too much blame on Bernie Sanders when every presidential candidate has its like cultish atmosphere surrounding it. So I don't want to pick on Bernie's campaign in that sense. I really at the same time, there is a kind of real um, stubborn intensity among his fans that is almost respectable. Um, but at the last rally I went to, it definitely seems as if the crowd has heard the message all before. Um, it seems as if people have heard these from these candidates too many times because we see them on TV all the time. They, they all commence their campaigns way too early. And so we, we've been forced to hear the slogans, the script over and over again. Um, with his with supporters, I honestly don't think they, they think about that because I think they think Hillary Clinton was a good person. I think most of the people at these Democratic uh, gatherings think that Hillary Clinton, no, no, seriously, they do. They think that Hillary Clinton was a great person. Um, They think that Joe Biden would be a fantastic president. They think Obama was a great humane man who did not bomb eight different countries and kill untold uh, numbers of thousands of people. Um, uh, They they have no idea that Hillary Clinton was uh, involved in the campaign against Bernie Sanders within the DNC. These people are so poorly educated politically and historically, it's not even funny. That's why I said I can't really stand listening to them for more than a few minutes because it's just so sickening to be uh, faced with their ignorance. You said it's like a bunch of them have uh, photos of themselves with candidates inside their houses and stuff. Is there any sense that like these people, because they live in New Hampshire and it's one of the first primary states, that they feel a sense of like entitlement to these people's time, to these people like caring about their problems? Or are they just grateful that the candidate graces them with their presence? I wouldn't say they feel grateful. Um, I would say it's more like they uh, feel blessed in a way where it's like, oh, this makes me feel special as a person that I got to stand with Hillary Clinton and she smiled as she put her hand on my shoulder. Um, I, uh, I, I, I would say that in New Hampshire, we're kind of just jaded in a sense where we, we are exposed to these candidates so many times that we, don't, we, we tend to forget that people elsewhere in the country don't get to see them every five minutes. There's a reason why I've been able to get most of them on the record about Julian Assange, and it's because they're, they're here constantly. There's um, the New Hampshire division of NPR has a calendar that shows you where they will be, and that's how I've been able to go out and try to get them on the records. I'm just like, oh, okay, uh, Bernie's going to be in Plymouth today. We'll go there. And next week, it looks like uh, Tulsi is going to be in Henniker, so we'll go there. And and the calendar is filled sometimes weeks in advance. Andrew Yang is doing some kind of thing called Politics and Eggs next Thursday at 8.30 in the morning. I, I haven't had the privilege of attending Politics and Eggs, but yeah, they swarm this state like hornets. 
it's it's a very um it's it's an infestation of corrupt uh pop, 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 washington psychopaths and so yeah we're so uh, we get such a glut of them that the magic fades away for us a long time ago do they try to go native at all i mean i mean, talked a, li a little bit before about like do they eat the food or whatever but do they try to like pretend like they're one of you or like oh, like try to oh, care about you know hundred percent Oh, oh yeah, hundred percent. Um, I didn't realize, and sometimes it's authentic. I didn't realize Andrew Yang actually attended a very prestigious private school here in New Hampshire back in the day. Oh, wow. uh, Phillips Exeter Academy. I had no idea. Tim Ryan, I found out, attended a uh, law school right here in Concord. Um, only like ten minutes down the street. It's uh, it's insane. A lot of them did doctoral or like uh, their their uh, juris doctorate um, studies here in New Hampshire. Um, they uh, they all have connections to local politicians because they've known Gene Shaheen, who is an extremely corrupt uh, uh, psychopath. They they it's a very incestuous field. So oh yeah, they constantly talk about how much they love New Hampshire. Um, Joe Biden actually at a rally a few weeks ago was in New Hampshire and he said, "I love being here in Vermont. It's such a great state." It, it was it, it's just it's shocking. Um, but uh, yeah, they definitely try to play up their New Hampshire roots. I was going to say, I expected Biden to forget where he was at least once publicly. I mean, he, he already has forgotten Obama's name, which he drops every other word. Yep. Like, I'm surprised he can yep. remember his own name at this point. Like, on the debate stage, he'll be like, oh, the gentleman from Vermont, or yeah, that guy. And it's like, dude, are we really going to elect this schmuck? Because I, I'm a little worried about that. At, at the house party in Atkinson, he didn't take his sunglasses off. I remember he's standing out there and goes, you know, we got to repair the spirit of this country. I really mean that. I mean, he can barely get out of bed. And that kind of faux compassion is just completely anachronistic in the Trumpish age. I mean, with Trump coming on the scene and exposing these people for what they are, you can't rely on the same old tricks. So if they're going to rely on the 1996 playbook in 2020, it, it, it ain't hopeful no more. I mean, what do they expect? But no, I, I sometimes I do find it disturbing, actually, to find out how much connection they actually have to New Hampshire. Because I'm thinking Andrew Yang went to high school here, a very prestigious high school. Does that mean his father was already talking to other politicians and trying to establish some kind of a network? Um, uh, uh, Tim Ryan going to law school here. Here, what other uh, future uh, and scumbags was he mingling with and uh, taking drugs with in the parking lot? You know, it, it's it. Who knows? It's um. I don't know how deep the rabbit hole goes, and I guess I'll never find out. But just little tidbits I get on the way, they try to point me in the right direction. Well, you know that Beto O'Rourke, like he was given that name because his father wanted him to go into politics and have an advantage in a primarily Hispanic community, which is just really disturbing. Especially when you consider like all the weird things that he did as a like young man, like mm -hmm. wearing uh, bunny onesies and uh, hacking, but not really hacking with a group called the Cult of the Dead Cow. It's like he specifically did these things so that his like rebel cred would resonate with young voters because he knows that he's a rich schmuck who has absolutely nothing to offer anybody. And oh, my internet connection is unstable again. I guess somebody doesn't like me talking bad about Beto. But um, yeah, yeah. I feel like a lot of these things are done to uh, just specifically. Who would have any problem with the things you you say, Helen? I don't know. No, uh, said, a, lot, said, a lot of people. No, 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 I was just making. Sure. Oh, a lot, a lot of people. Um, but I, I did. I they they do. But um, I I got it. I got the gist of what you were saying. You were talking about Beto or being a rich schmuck, and I got the part about the uh the bunny onesies. Um, you yeah, always he, give he's, me a provocative. <laughs> You know, he's he's got he's, he does these like rebellious things to uh, to set up for future political run uh, his his rebel cred with like young people because he doesn't have anything to offer them other than that. Did did you hear the story? I don't know if this is true. Did you hear the story about how he put two when he, he was um, making some. Uh, announcement to his wife about whether they were having a baby or something like that. He uh, he put two uh, bowls on the kitchen table. One had chocolate and the other had feces. And he was gonna like you know do it to say whether when whether they were having a baby or not. Did you hear that story? I did not hear that story. I heard he likes <laughs> to eat dirt, but I didn't know about the feces bowls. It wouldn't surprise me. The guy is sick. He's a sick yeah. He uh, that was on that was on uh, Glenn Beck. Show. 
Oh, so I, I don't know if it was true or not. But he actually, Glenn Beck did a devastating takedown of Beto O'Rourke. That was, um, <laughs> it wasn't funny. It was, it was really grotesque because it showed how he was working to kick these um, indigenous uh, Mexicans off of their land so that a developer could come in and build a Kmart or something like that. It was really disheartening. I, I encourage everybody to watch that. If half of it is true, then he is one of the most repulsive politicians ever. Um, I met Beto O'Rourke only once. That was at the convention back in September. And uh, really in a good mood for that convention because I uh, had, um, you could not buy alcohol until noon and it was $10 a beer. So that was a, a problem for me. Um, but Beto O'Rourke was actually standing right next to me and I didn't even realize it. And I turned and he made sure to give me all smiles because he's such a handsome man. And he was friendly with me saying, how's the atmosphere in here before he even introduced himself. So we took a selfie and then immediately I asked him, oh, do you want to answer a question? His heart fell out of his ass. He was just like devastated. And you can <laughs> you can see um, the change in the picture I took with him. The change in demeanor from that to the video in which I asked him about Assange, he looks completely miserable. It's as if his dog just died or something. I mean, the, the shift that these people go through between the photo op and the question about Assange is very telling. Mm -hmm. That's when their, uh, their demeanors are stripped off and we see them for the soulless, vacuous villains that they are. I find it interesting that he like went out of his way to try to do like a regular guy thing because he must know on some level that he's just like insanely wealthy and extremely privileged and really has no nothing in common with the average voter but he tries to present himself as this like regular not even regular but like he he'll drop an f-bomb every so often to like you know i use four letter words too i'm not just a patrician schmuck kicking indigenous people off their land i didn't marry yeah. into a gigantic Puts his pants country. on the same way as every yeah, puts his pants on. No, he hires somebody to put his pants on and then and then does it again for the camera after his pants are already on. He puts on a stunt pair of pants. But um yeah, I guess that's pretty much Um Yeah, the regular Well, go ahead. Sorry, no, continue. Go ahead. Oh, the the, uh, the the regular guy thing, um, yeah, the, the one I find most repulsive is actually going back to my buddy, Cory Booker. Um, it, it just full disclosure, I have a special antipathy for that man because of the way he personally disrespected me after I drove 140 miles to try to get him on the record about Assange. Um, we won't get into that, though. I've talked about that elsewhere. Just, uh, you know, he's, he's just a despicable individual. Um, his attempt sort of depict the himself as a regular guy he lives supposedly in projects out in newark new jersey and um he lives like in a shady or sh a shoddy apartment building in a, a rough part of town um people is that the two apartments adjacent his are um staffed 24 hours a day by armed security um, I don't know where Cory Booker is, probably dinner with his movie star girlfriend, Rosario Dawson. But but as we speak, in the two apartments adjacent his are at least two armed security guards sitting there making sure that nobody comes around to mess around with the senator. Um, so I don't know how much that's costing the taxpayers of uh, his uh, district. But at the same time, maybe those two apartments in that not so glamorous building could be better served if they were rented out to low income people, rather than being used to fund his pathetic vanity project. Um, it's things like this that I just find really distasteful. Where it's like, so you get to go out there so you can play, I don't know, play house or something. I mean, I mean, it's just that kind of stuff is just nauseating to behold. Well, I think that most humans have like an instinctive negative reaction to hypocrisy. I mean, Booker, of course, is one of these ones who wants to take away Americans' guns. And of course, he has hugely expensive security detail. And Beto is another one who's extremely rich, has a personal security, but he doesn't want anybody else to have any firearms because, you know, they might like use them for something. It's like, you know, you buy them with the hope of not having to use them, but uh, if you take away everybody's guns, then, you know, people who break the law anyway by killing people will gladly buy one. I mean, that's a really obvious argument and everybody makes it, but don't want to get too far on that tangent, I guess. As, 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 as Bart Simpson once said, I'm safe. Murder's illegal in this state. <laughs>
Exactly. Um, is there anything else that you that has struck you about the candidates as far as just like who they are as people, who they appear to be as people, or like the a juxtaposition of who they are and who people think they are? Um, well, the I, I, one of the things I find really repulsive is the fact that these events are constantly sponsored by, um, I don't know, were we going to go into that later, the idea of the uh, who's sponsoring the events, like who's hosting oh, the no, events? Oh, no, please, please do. I forgot to ask that. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, one of the things I found really disgusting was um, the, uh, the ACLU hosted Tim Ryan's event in Concord. Um, I don't know why they hosted his event because his speech had nothing to do with civil liberties. It was just a, a typical stump speech about, um, you know, uh, the economy and trade and uh, things of that nature. And um, the woman who hosted the event asked him quite a bit about um, her big thing was giving incarcerated people the right to vote. Um, she believes that people in prison should have the right to vote. Tim Ryan felt differently, and she really pushed him on that. She really, really said that people should have the right to vote even if they're in prison for the following reasons. When I asked him about Julian Assange, and he said he would not support Julian Assange, that woman did not ask a single follow-up question. And this is the ACLU we're talking about here. Um, Likewise, uh, the, there was a group at the, at the convention called the Firefighters for Biden who rented out an entire suite that was sponsored, I think, in part by Sam Adams. Um, you couldn't get in there. There was a security guard standing outside at all times just to make sure nobody snuck in to get uh, the sandwiches or the beer, uh, you know, because it's that important to keep out the commoners and the plebes. Um, you see a lot of really intense, uh, not necessarily corporate sponsorship, but these organizations and unions and so on that really raise the question about how, how incestuous and how deep are these ties. I don't think anybody gets to the status of running for president without having at least a few like special interest groups in their pocket or whatnot. But I mean, yeah, I'm really disappointed in the ACLU. They are no longer uh, have anything to do with civil liberties. Now it's all, I used to for some reason get like mailing from them and it would ask you like, about these issues, which ones do you care about, blah, blah, blah. It'd always be about like uh, immigrants or LGBT or, and it's like, dude, your civil liberties for American citizens. Can we protect those first? There are other groups for those other things. They're important, yes, but mm -hmm. civil liberties, that's what you're supposed to do. Why are you not doing it? I would always like write these really long, complicated responses. And I guess somebody respected that because they would always send me like a membership card, even though I never gave them any money. But I don't know, they did take oh, my- I, I, I've been put on so many spam lists and mailing lists because of this, you wouldn't believe it. Kamala Harris, I think, still sends me emails for some reason, even though I've, used in very strong language, um, I've, I've, I've told them I don't want to have anything to do with their garbage campaign. Um, but the thing is, when you go to a lot of these events, you have to give your email address, and that's how they start spamming you. Um, you have to give some form of registration, typically, and so they make sure to get you on their mailing list, and they've got five secondary mailing lists, so you've got to unsubscribe from like 20 different things. It's like cutting heads off the hydra. It just, it never stops. Um, they get you one way or the other. The gone are the days of just simple registration. Sometimes you can just do paper registration and give a fake email address like I often do. I don't know if it's a crime for me to admit that, but whatever. Do they sell those mailing lists? Uh, have you gotten like emails from random things that you think might have been them selling it or is it just for their own purposes? Not that I know of, but I do know that Tulsa, one of the reasons Tulsi Gabbard was suing Google was because um, apparently they were filtering the email list so that people weren't getting her notifications. Um, I actually have had to sign up for the press release for the Tulsi campaign several times just so I'm aware of what's going on. And I don't know, for some reason, her campaign faces a lot of glitches that uh, Kamala Harris certainly doesn't uh, seem to encounter when she's flooding my inbox. Well, yeah, you remember when after this, I think it was the second debate that Tulsi was in, and then everybody else was trending, and she was like the number one search name, but if you, t if you looked on Twitter, you know, what was, what was trending? Oh, Assad, because, you know, everybody was talking about the president of Syria right after the Democratic debate. That's what everybody talked about. Duh. No, and, and it's like, it becomes obvious when you know that, like, uh, one of the people at, at Twitter works for Kamala Harris's campaign, so you, you really, you, there's no uh, wonder there.
Anyway, you were going to say something. Yeah, no, I um, I, I definitely I remember that happening. I wrote an article about that. And um, oh, Kamala Harris, actually, since you mentioned her, this is kind of just is uh, going uh, in a random direction here. But um, one of the things that people don't know is, did, did you hear the controversy about uh, her laughing when the man in the audience described Donald Trump as retarded? No. Yeah, one. there was a man who said that he, he called Trump mentally retarded or something like that. And Kamala Harris laughed and said, well, uh, well put. There was some controversy where she came out, she had to come out and say, I would never disparage uh, you know, people with intellectual disabilities, et cetera, et cetera. What people forget, and what I witnessed, is that just a few hours before that event at the convention, she went out of her way to stroke the hands of a man with some kind of intellectual disability, possibly Down syndrome, and constantly saying to him, thank you for being here. I'm so glad you came. Did you have a good time? Because there's constantly people surrounding or everywhere um you know people with cameras and cell phones you can't get away from these people um so she was she, she's pulling that kind of photo op just a few hours before she's uh, behaving quite differently with a different man in the audience so the the, the 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 insincerity from these people is just so nauseating i i mean that's why i with a, with a woman like that i'm wondering do i really need to go try to get her on the record regarding assange are there any people with integrity who actually believe that that woman is going to do anything of moral decency once she's given the keys to the kingdom yeah i mean i find it really disturbing that after tulsi even on the debate stage exposed uh, the the negatives of uh, kamala harris which are about uh, 500 pages long and really she only exposed a tiny sliver of all of those, those negatives but the fact that there are still people supporting her and there are people who are upset with tulsi for talking about it of course who, like i said she, she got bumped mm -hmm. off the twitter trending list even though everybody was talking about her and um that really it says something about the either the people who are framing the conversation because as many people forget twitter is not real life and the vast majority of voters and americans and people in general don't use twitter and it's mostly like at this point bots anyway because they've kicked everybody with like legitimate political opinions off but um yeah it just uh, you you really wonder it, it, a country who supports somebody like this or and you said that there are people who like stand outside her events and say and chant about it's time for a woman in the White House. And you said you didn't yes. think that they were like paid or plants. Um, what do you think motivates those people? Um, immaturity, a lack of political knowledge, um, a kind of presumptuous um, self-aggrandizing belief that they're making the world a better place by shilling for this uh, detached dysfunctional millionaire um, that's the that's the thing is that they a lot of them are paid by her staff don't get me wrong but there are several people in the audience who are they just they have they have nothing better to do with their times and it can look good on your college resume if you state that part of your um the volunteer work was with this campaign because somehow volunteering for a campaign is looked at the same way as you know working at a soup kitchen or something like that um it's all charitable uh use of your time either way which which is just a disgusting equi um, equation but but anyway uh yeah no i a sense you and i had that discussion about them being well paid i i i've thought about it a little bit more I would assume actually that when you see these mass crowds of people like in a parade or something like that uh, shilling for Kamala Harris, I would say probably about at least 50% of them are paid because that's the difference between her campaign and say Tulsi Gabbard's campaign would be that Kamala does not have enough or Kamala has much more money. And so she can spend that money on staffers. That, that's the point is that you see so many more people there and there's so much more um, obsessive and directed in their tasks that you can tell that somebody's paying them to be very much on point. And, and that's what happens with, with a, a lot of these uh, upper tier candidates like Joe Biden. Speaking of uh, people paying people to do certain things, like you, sponsoring uh, the events, like are, is, is the sponsorship, like is it really obvious? Like are they product placement, any kind of thing like that? Or is it just like this is sponsored by yeah. X and we leave that at the door? Because I would really like to know if like they're, they're drinking a, a Coca-Cola and it's like, oh, Coca-Cola paid for that. Or is it not quite that obvious yet? 
No, it's not quite that obvious. I'm sorry. It's not like NASCAR where they just wear the corporate logos on their uh, suits. I, I wish it were. Sorry to disappoint you, but no, they uh, they just say that it's the event is hosted by like a local uh, Democratic uh, committee or something like that, or like a group like Students for Democracy or something. So if you um, if you were to look into that group's associations, you could see who's funding them, and then maybe they are receiving some kind of corporate money if you go further and further up the ladder. But um, I haven't pursued that kind of investigative journalism work on that front just yet. It sounds like something you might be interested in. <laughs> well, you, you did mention that like Sam Adams was uh, some, somehow involved in Biden's thing. I was just wondering if there were oh, other- Oh, like, yes. Yeah, that that was a special thing, though, because that was just at the convention. Um, that convention uh, was a little bit different. At a standard Joe Biden rally, you wouldn't see that kind of uh, product placement, though. No. Um, the Joe Biden rally, actually, uh, or the, the convention, we had there were these gigantic banners hanging from the rafters of the arena. It was a sports arena where I went to at the convention. Um, the banners for the candidates cost almost $3,000 a piece. And um, you just look up there and you see these gigantic banners, probably about the size of, I'd say they're bigger than the bookcase behind me. And um, yeah, $2,800 a pop. Joe Biden had in one section of the, uh, or right near the Firefighters for Biden uh, stand, he had probably, I've got the picture online so people can check it, but it, I'd say probably about 20 or 25 of those signs. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's, um, I mean, he does bring in the money from the big donors, but uh, obviously there aren't a lot of people behind those donors. I mean, is there any hope of like reversing this process of just people being bought and paid for, or should we just uh, throw in the towel on, you know, this whole democracy experiment? I mean, the idea of a grassroots campaign is it's kind of like when we talk about independent cinema, where I just, I, I have to roll my eyes. Like when people talk about oh, this independent, but like when I say Quentin Tarantino was an independent filmmaker when he was doing Pulp Fiction. Um, oh, really? Because you, because independent filmmakers have Samuel L. Jackson's contact information in their back pocket. Um, yeah, the same with political campaigns. The idea of it being a, 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 a grassroots, grassroots basically, I don't even know what that word means. Um, no, there, there's, you need a lot of money just to be able to fly to New Hampshire every other weekend to make your little speech. You have to pay to organize this sort of, uh, the, these events where you have the giant American flag in the background. You have to pay somebody to rig the sound equipment. You have to pay to have crowd control, registration, promotion. Um, uh, yeah, all, all of that is, is very time consuming. There's no way that one e individual who's doing it just part-time in addition to working at the local target is going to be able to scrape together the funds necessary to mount that kind of national campaign i, I mean i mean if you don't have the money to do that then you're not going to be able to visit a state like new hampshire very often so it's um you can run on a campaign of principle but you're not going to win the white house doing that I don't, I don't think you can even win like a lesser thing. Like a lot of people were upset on the right, I guess, because they found out that oh, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the um, New York Congresswoman, had been like sort of picked from some sort of casting call kind of thing. And then she was chosen by like justice Democrats to run, and et cetera, et cetera. And people were mm. up in arms about that. But as you say, the, the idea that someone just gets it into their head to run for office and they do so like without any backing or help from other organizations or from other like political groups is kind of uh, not not the way things are done. So um, yeah, and I um, don't think, and anything above dog catcher, you're not really just nominating yourself and sailing into the race. Uh, yeah, I mean, maybe you could win some kind of really small local thing where you're elected to like state government or something like that without any money, but, but at the national level, no. And actually, um, I remember actually going back to Glenn Beck, he was interviewing Bill O'Reilly a while ago, and O'Reilly pointed out something very disturbing about Ocasio-Cortez that I never even thought of. He pointed out that she could not have known on her own that that uh, district in the, in the Bronx was uh, ripe for a newcomer because she had no polling information 
information showing the uh, the weaknesses of uh, Crowley. She there was no she had no information on hand showing that the people were sick of him that they thought he was you know a do nothing who uh, was taking the district nowhere. Um, so that's another level of uh, of. Uh, structural knowledge that an average person just would not possess, especially in her case where she's supposedly, uh, you know, uh, attending bar 40 hours a week. Um, yeah, you could do, you could do local government. Um, it'd be possible that I could a uh, seat to the local, uh, legislature, but as far as go, uh, defeating any of the, uh, Annie Custer or, uh, Chris Pappas to try to get at the, uh, you know, national level, it's just not going to happen. When you were at any of these uh, events, like, were there any questions about foreign policy beyond that one audience plant who asked uh, Tulsi about uh, Modi in India? Like, do people in these audiences actually care about foreign policy or are they screened beforehand to make sure they don't ask about foreign policy? Or, because like, I would think that that would be a big issue since that's where the majority of our tax dollars go. And it's like the most of, most of the bad things about America in foreigners' eyes are, you know, the fact that we kill people. So I was just curious if anybody comments on that or if that's like kind of a don't ask, don't tell sort of situation. Well, most Americans are so poorly educated when it comes to foreign policy that they wouldn't, um, they wouldn't be able to ask a, any kind of serious question. When people ask about foreign policy at these uh, events, they're asking about what uh, you intend to do about Russia. Um, they, they talk about Trump making, uh, supposedly bringing us, uh, merging us with uh, the Russian government or now the Turkish government. Um, they're, they're not asking any serious questions about how are you going to cut down on all of the money uh, that we waste overseas. Um, it, it's just, a, again, it's in a very superficial corporate friendly sense where what are you going to do about Russian interference in the election from three years ago? Um, are you going to make sure that we... Uh, keep up our military exercises uh, and aggression against Iran or so and so on and so forth. Occasionally you'll get somebody who asks Joe Biden about why he voted for the Iraq war, but I'm convinced that those people in the audience are plants because they, it, he just always, he gives the same answer every single time. And it's an astonishing answer. Actually, it's, it's, it's unbelievable. He says that he did not vote to send troops into Iraq. He says he voted because he thought that the authorization was just about sending weapons in, or uh, nuclear inspectors into uh, Baghdad. That's what he says at these rallies. That is the lie, he says, which, which, which I have a, a follow up to that, sir. If you are telling the truth and you were unaware that when you were voting for that, you were not voting to send how many thousands of uh, troops over there and weaponry and so on, then you lack the mental stamina required to be the president of the United States. That is all the proof we need to disqualify you for the job immediately. But yes, that is what he's been telling people at every event that I've attended. That's, yeah, that's really surprising because you would think like better to be wrong than incompetent or like, I, I don't know. I mean, is it better to be wrong than incompetent? When you've got a politician, yes. you want him to be able to read legislation. Like that's kind of important. Yeah. Or to be able to read like a simple, I don't know, a memo about, hey, somebody just launched nuclear weapons. Maybe we should throw some back. Not misread, oh, there's a bake sale as, oh, we need to bomb Russia. It's like, I don't know, it seems, seems like yeah. that would be a little bit important. But, um, yeah, they, they will ask the candidates about, you know, what do you think about Trump praising dictators? Like this very superficial sense that obviously has no context because we associate with all sorts of dictators. Basically, every single leader of a nation on earth is a dictator. But for some reason, it's only when Trump uh, poses for a picture with Kim Jong-un that the world is coming to an end. It's, it's a very, uh, very it's again it's just, uh, it, it it reveals how little they actually understand about the way our government operates and functions and all the chaos and tragedy that we inflict all over the world so as long as we have that kind of immaturity and ignorance you're going to get stupid questions like that that the candidates can easily restructure as a softball so it's like a mutually beneficial like symbiosis of uh, patheticness or symbiosis of selloutness or I don't know. It, just, it seems like both sides get something from this, but neither is getting what like the media would like us to think they're getting. It's the, the, the audience gets to feel validated or you get to feel like somebody cares about the future of this country or something, or gets to feel like, they, like they're special, like you said. And then the candidate gets to feel like they have a failing base and that you know, people want to see them succeed or people are at least gullible enough to give them money. 
Uh, yeah, and they, um, the bigger the candidate, the fewer questions that they will take. Like uh, Joe Biden, for example, will take only three questions when he has crowds of like probably about uh, 250 people. So the odds are he's not going to encounter anybody too tough. Also, um, people who are actively protesting are kept away from the inside of the event. Um, like when I went to Elizabeth Warren's rally back in January, there were people dressed up as devils uh, protesting, but they were told that they couldn't come within a certain number of feet of the building. So once you're inside, um, once you're within the perimeter, as it were, um, protesters are not welcome. That's what happened at the Trump rally I went to was a group called Jews for Palestine had their sign uh, destroyed. And I think one of them may have been shoved even by this uh, bulky, uh, deranged man in the audience. Um, oh, if someone were to try something similar at a Joe Biden rally, they could be escorted out by Secret Service. It's not really something you want to mess around with. These events are supposedly all just grassroots and cozy and we're all buddy-buddy with each other, but there, there are, uh, there's armed security there and they can really mess you up if you try anything funny. So it's very much, there's this uh, pervasive sense of unease at these events. Well, sounds like sort of a, a metaphor for the, the, the country in general. So, yeah, we have free speech completely, but like free speech within certain boundaries. If you step outside, we'll come to your house and we'll call yes. you away. So, I mean, I guess it's, yeah, good practice for real life. But um, this is what, last question, I guess, is going to be kind of superficial. Which among them has had like plastic surgery or work done on their teeth or had themselves spruced up to look like more presidential? Oh, dear Lord. They've had, um, <laughs> had work done on their teeth. There's no way all those teeth are real. Well, um, my video of Bernie Sanders was more about the lower half of Bernie's jaw. And so if you wanted to check out his dental work, you'd have a pretty good opportunity to do so. The, uh, the thing about that Bernie event was, and you can actually see it in the video if you look, is... Um, he had some kind of white crust right there on his lip and it was, I wanted to say something, but you can't. And he tried to, if you look at the video, it's close enough to his lips that you can see it. And it, just sometimes with them, I don't know if they realize they, I, I um, yeah. So as for who has had uh, work done in some sense, uh, <laughs> Andrew Yang kind of looks like a wax doll, I would say, sometimes. Um, they definitely have to put some kind of uh, oil on his skin to sort of keep him looking fresh. But uh, yeah, under the bright lights, um, we all look like wax sculptures, I guess. Yeah, it's not, not flattering lighting up there. And it just makes you sweat no. and makes you look unpleasant in general. I mean, Nixon figured that out the hard way. <laughs> And that, that's sort of what's happened to me out there on the campaign trail is I just, I, I become the, the groggy, sweaty, broken down person that I just don't have the enthusiasm that I did when I first went out. What well, you can see in the video I did with Andrew Yang, I'm all smiles and very joyously like, mm -hmm. and, and then by the time you get to my uh, question with uh, Beto O'Rourke, I just look more like put off and be, bemused than anything else it's just a very uh, it's the breaking down of the spirit so i see that um my next uh candidate is probably going to be amy, amy klobuchar i gotta ask her how she feels about assange and and so when i'm getting ready for that event i know what i'm gonna be thinking i'm gonna be thinking <sighs> going to klobuchar <laughs> and just uh, staggering my way out the door it's it's not going to be good but that that's that's who i am now it's the cinnabon effect comes for us all <laughs> It will get you too. She's a singularly unpleasant human being. I mean, you can just tell by looking at her. She's got this fake, everything is fake, like this, this smile that's like so fake. I, I don't know. I mean, I guess they, they probably have the same thing where they're, they're just sick of like having to do the same thing over and over again. So as you said earlier, that that kills the spirit a little bit. But then it's like, okay, well, why are you doing this? <laughs> Well, well she, she's from Minnesota, and I guess it's even colder over there than it is in New Hampshire. Um, it, it, they, it's, just, uh, it, it's just the Arctic, from what I hear. Her, her, the photo that she sends out on her postcard is 
her getting pounded by snow when she's trying to make a speech. Um, it's it, yeah, there's a lot of self-deprecation that these candidates engage in. I wouldn't be surprised if you know one day they start like you know dropping their pants just so people can point and laugh at them. But it's uh, it's a little too intimate. That's that's the word that they use out there a lot on the can they use it a lot on the campaign trails intimate like if it's a house party they say it's a very intimate atmosphere when andrew yang went to gibson's bookstore it's an intimate atmosphere because we get to get right up close with the candidates and pose for pictures and brush shoulders and smell their deodorant <laughs> but um they get a little bit more intimacy than they bargained for when i start asking them about julian assange why do you think they do that with like the because i know that beto sent the picture of him like getting or the, the video of him rather getting his teeth drilled or at the doctor's office or elizabeth warren with her like weird beer conversation and like <laughs> why, why do they do that shit i mean is it to, to be more relatable is it like yeah it, it's yeah yeah yeah, it, yeah it's this attempt to try to um it's 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 an attempt to break down this image of the aristocrat who's speaking down on everyone from on high. It's the, they're trying to like reduce them to our level, as it were. But it's completely unconvincing because because again, Cory Booker is flanked by security. He's a multi. He's he's a very wealthy man. I mean, I don't know how rich these people actually are, but they have plenty of money. And, and they don't live the way that we do. They're being constantly shuttled. Uh, that kind of lifestyle will pamper you eventually. It'll it'll uh, soften you in a way that we just can't understand. Jimmy Dore recently, or it wasn't even recently, he was mocking Bill Maher, saying that Bill Maher's problem is that he's out of touch. And I can't wait until I'm rich enough that I'm out of touch and I won't have any idea what people are talking about. Um, yeah, that's what happens to these politicians, is they may have good intentions, but at the end of the day, they get so... Uh, they they are surfeited by it all that they can't uh they, they just can't stomach real life so they have to fake it by showing hey we put our pants on the same way as everybody else but um, it's just it's very unconvincing all right well on that depressing note i guess uh that's pretty much it i mean people can check out your writing at overwritten.org um mm -hmm. and you're dak rouleau on twitter everybody I still am as far as i know Everybody who's watching this already knows you can find my work at HelenOfDestroy.com and Velocirapture23 on Twitter. And um, yeah, that's about it. So uh, enjoy your uh, Klobuchar hunting and uh, I hope you get a, <laughs> I hope she doesn't like sweat on you or something or, or, or oh, smile. I don't want to go. <laughs> I don't want to go. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. Be strong. Be strong. You're doing it for Julian. Yes. All right.